Thank you very much, and, and thank you to Hadaya and the organisers. It's nice to be back face to face. I know this is a hybrid event, which I often appreciate from Australia, being able to join things that I can't travel to, but it is so nice to be here. I, I've got a lot of slides, more than you need for 15 minutes, but I'll stick to my 15 minutes. I'm going. To, thank you. That's very helpful. Um, it's sort of like a Mission Impossible <laughs> countdown clock. <laughs> yeah. It, does it explode at the end? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, I'm going to move through slides quickly because I think the big picture is important. I, I've been researching Indonesia the last 35 years, and a lot last 22 years looking at um, questions of extremism and uh, I still managed to confuse myself. Um, I hope I don't confuse you but I think the big picture is really important to understand where Indonesia is at. It's, it's a work in progress in every respect including in dealing with rehabilitation. So I'll talk about the, the history of um, the terrorist threats that it's been facing, how that's generated large numbers of detainees, how they've responded to that and then finally on the Syrian returnees which is um, very much a work in progress. Um, so Indonesia, uh, as you'd be aware, went through a democratic transition in 98-99. In, in um, it's culturally moderate. The, the um, continuing success with democracy has gone a long way to helping with the success with dealing with violent extremism. So it does have an energetic minority that is a problem. Some of them are drawn into violent extremist groups, um, uh, beginning with inspired, ins groups inspired by Al-Qaeda, then Islamic State. Uh, it largely has this problem under control. It does have a problem with hateful extremism, which my colleagues spoke about. So uh, day to day, that's probably the more felt need. But they are so far on top of a, of a very resilient problem. Things really, um, a pivot point uh, that really changed things was, of course, the attacks 21 years ago in, in Bali. Um, uh, overnight, a couple of large um, uh, suicide bombings, one large uh, vehicle-based bomb, uh, causing the loss of 202 lives, 88 of whom were Australian, so it sort of resonates in Australia. Uh, it really transformed thinking. Um, it led, fortunately, to some really good interventions with Australian Federal Police. It transformed that group. It transformed the Indonesian police in ways I'll explain quickly. But it, it has um, deeper origins. The origins began with a, um, a series of insurgencies after the, um, after the end of the Second World War and fighting the Dutch forces returning. Uh, some breakaway elements um, used Islamic language and then became increasingly proto-Islamist in their, in their activism. Uh, JI was a group that came out of this. It was formed through a community that had made, um, as they saw it, Hijra to uh, first off to Malaysia, then to uh, Afghanistan and trained people there. Um, they came back to Indonesia, saw a fresh opportunity with the fall of Suharto. Most of them actually were not involved in violence, but breakaway younger people uh, who were frustrated with the leadership got involved in a series of activities. We didn't see it at the time. Um, uh, you know, problems in, in Sulawesi, for example, were dismissed as elite manipulation to try and destabilize the Wahid government. Um, even quite well-coordinated attacks like Christmas Eve um, attacks on churches in 2000, we didn't see the pattern at the time. Um, it, that Bali bombing, though, of course, in, in 2002, um, made it clear and the cooperation with the Australian Federal Police and the, the post-bust uh, uh, forensic work suddenly revealed a pattern of uh, an indigenous um, homegrown network that was problematic and that was really transformative. Um, there were a series of attacks through that decade. The last major one was 2009 and after that the problem with JIA was largely under control. Um, in the process in 2004 uh, the Indonesian police stood up a special detachment uh, 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 which they called Denzel 88, um, uh, which people often think of as being involved in, you know, doing um, uh, high-risk arrests, but actually a lot of their work is intelligence. A lot of it's very good human intelligence, and a lot of that's come out of how they respond to people they arrest, um, and sort of a, a kind of intuitive approach to um, rehabilitation of detainees, which has served them very well. Um, so a lot of the um, work that was done on they would often call it de-radicalisation. We can argue the terminology. It's not the best terminology. It's really disengagement. But um, they worked through a large volume of people um, between 2002 and 2014. Um, in theory, uh, this should go beyond what the police do. There's a, a national counterterrorism uh, agency, which BNPT, which is supposed to take charge of this. It did relaunch a, bl a blueprint document, which largely remains in place. Um, with some minor updates in 2014 about how they would approach de-radicalisation. The ideas were good, the challenge is the execution and the resourcing, particularly in prisons. Prisons were, you know, roughly, are still roughly overcrowded by at least a factor of two. Um, parole officers are in, in vanishingly small numbers, hundreds of parole officers for tens of thousands of prisoners. 
um, and not a lot of training and capacity in terms of how to deal with, with really um, high-risk prisoners. So uh, BNPT has increasingly taken the lead with uh, de-radicalisation programs. Uh, there's been some really good work done with the uh, University of Indonesia, so Professor Hamdi Muluk and others have been involved. It's been a very transformative process, but it's still an incomplete business. Um, one of the things they have focused on is what happens after prisoners come out of prison, because as I said, there's not enough parole officers, um, and in any case, if you serve your full sentence, you're not, you're not, you're not subject to parole. Uh, if you go back to your old networks, the chances of recidivism is very high. And Indonesia has had a recidivism rate of probably around 14%. It's really hard to measure, and it, of course it depends where you put the, the measurement points, but a fairly significant rate of recidivism, recidivism for terrorism detainees. Uh, so programs such as uh, vocational training, micro-business, micro um, it's easy to dismiss these things as being idealistic and, and naive, but actually um, if you don't try and do something in this space, then you're, you're bound to have worse problems. Uh, this was a, a, a challenge that was being uh, not fully met, but was being, being met to a considerable degree, and certainly the problem of um, extremism at large was being met up until um, the rise of the Islamic State Caliphate. And then suddenly, I mean, this was true in Australia as well as Indonesia, we became aware in hindsight that we had people who had traveled. It's now thought as many as 2,000 Indonesians traveled to Syria. Uh, most of them not thinking they'd become fighters, most of them thinking they would become you know, supporters of a utopian project. Um, but that's a very large number of people. I mean, uh, probably a quarter of them didn't make it to Syria, but were detained in countries like Turkey, which is something I'll speak about in a minute. But this suddenly flipped the script. Um, Abu Bakr Bashir, who had been leading JI, signed up um, in you know, sort of a moment of attention deficit disorder, uh, uh, signed up on a video swearing allegiance by art to IS. Um, there were some um, largely ineffective, thankfully, attacks launched in the name of Islamic State, um, including in central Jakarta. Um, good cooperation on intelligence had taken out the key team that was planning that attack, so a, a B team turned up who were not very competent, thankfully, um, but it's a reminder of how important that is. So a lot of the problems manifested themselves as um, lone actor suicide attacks on police. So this was a, a, a modus operandi. They were targeting uniformed personnel. Uh, up until May uh, 2018, when suddenly three churches and a police station were hit by suicide bombers, and really disturbingly, the suicide bombers involved whole families, mothers and their children, uh, wearing explosives on, on the back of motorbikes. Uh, really tragically sad situation. And that suddenly brought forward a, a series of legislative reforms. So laws that had been waiting to be processed by parliament, which is not particularly efficient in Indonesia, suddenly were pushed, pushed through. And um, suddenly the police, the, the Detachment 88, had uh, the tools they needed to make preemptive arrests, which of course is a concern, but in this space, if you don't get on top of the problem, uh, you're not going to deal with the issues properly. Because the flip side of doing preemptive arrests um, when people are planning and supporting uh, terrorist plots and terrorist networks is that suddenly you have a large number of detainees. So you can see here the, the, the figures. Um, the number of terrorism incidents have been kept under control. That's a real, uh, I think, mark of success given the challenge they're facing, a very resilient challenge. But the number of arrests has increased sharply. Some of that jumps up in 2018 when that new legislation comes through, but it's not just that. It's, these networks are very, very resilient. And people who had been previously arrested um, generally served fairly short sentences for weapons possession or something like that, and three or four years later they're, they're out. So that makes, um, means you're constantly chasing your tail. Um, mostly men, of course, but, but um, increasingly women, including we saw with the Surabaya attacks, women involved in active frontline attacks. Um, so the, the current figures, as best as I can tell, um, more or less uh, current now, we have um, two cohorts of people um, facing terrorism charges. Well, there's 500 odd who have been charged with terrorism offences, but another slightly larger number, 600, who are, uh, at least as of a year ago, in pre-trial detention on terrorism charges or facing terrorism charges. So 1,000 people plus who, um, depending on what happens with the pre-trial people who are uh, have this connection with extremism. Uh, so that's a really large body to work through. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot that's been published about this. You, you may have seen this, uh, I'll just sort of flag this report recently that's quite useful. Um, it's looked at um, uh, what we can say about what's working in this space and certainly the, the, the strength of the Indonesian context and, and what has worked with civil society groups is um, working with families and community networks, particularly when 
people return when they're released from prison. Um, there's been some good studies done, a handful, but I mean, this, it's worth looking up uh, from that report. And a series of um, CSOs have been drawn into this space. Uh, for a longer period of time, CSOs have been involved in CVE in terms of basically primary intervention to try and um, slow down or, or decrease um, vulnerability to recruitment. But increasingly, they've been involved in people in prison and uh, people uh, more recently coming back from Syria. Um, a, a group that I've been involved with um, out, out of my university deacon, but uh, across uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, Thailand, and the Philippines is a group we call the Southeast Asian Network of CSOs, or Sean CSO, which I suppose is a very Anglosphere kind of way of approaching the acronym. But Sean CSO um, has a whole bunch of um, CSOs working in the CVE space. Only if a few of these are doing uh, tertiary interventions, rehabilitation, but, but some significant work being done there. Um, people like Anur Huda Ismail, you're probably familiar with, I think is in this space. His, his group, Yaisan um, uh, Prasati Padamayan, has done some really pioneering work with terrorism detainees, particularly in terms of equipping them to come out of prison. Um, and some of them have been involved in preparing for the, uh, the flow the flood eventually, perhaps, of uh, returnees from Syria and Iraq. And it's, as I said, it's thought that something like 2,000 people went to Syria, uh, mostly Syria via Turkey and some on to Iraq. And um, uh, a quarter of them uh, you know, attempted that, that trip that got stopped in Turkey. Um, and a large number have come back from Turkey, but there's still a, a lot, and there's a, a large cohort in um, in northern Syria, of course, at the moment. And there's a large cohort, we don't even know where they are, so that's another issue in itself. But um, Indonesia has sort of wrestled with whether they take to uh, returnees, as, as, as Australia has done. Um, uh, unfortunately, they, they came to a decision, um, having made some initial small group returnees in, in 2017, they came to a decision to stop uh, returnees. Um, saying it was too difficult, too risky, didn't want to do it, uh, which is what many Western governments have said as well. That's beginning to change now, and some groups have been tasked. That 2017 returnee group um, saw the formation of an alliance of CSOs uh, um, uh, under the acronym CSAVE to work on rehabilitation. Uh, one of the key groups has been uh, a, a um, CSO called uh, Yayasan Empatiku, which has done some really important uh, low-key work with um, rehabilitation. Um, one of the problems, of course, is, is working out what, you, what risks levels you have. So whether it's people coming out of prison or coming back from Syria, how do you assess them um, for the, the risk they may present to themselves and others? And um, how do you see whether you're making progress? And long story short, we don't have good tools. But um, I'll talk to some work that's been done in this space. Um, so uh, um, uh, Empatiku has is, is recently launched a book. There's going to be a, a seminar next week in Jakarta I'll attend, um, looking at early warning signs. And this is based on work that um, the Sean CSO and, and the Australian Multicultural Foundation had done with, um, with researchers who would come out of Monash University uh, and the Global Terrorism Research Centre years ago on a risk assessment tool. Uh, and this looks at that um, observable social behaviour using um, structured professional judgement. I won't go into the details, but that's been very effective. One of the, um, the case studies in um, the online tool that um, you can still access at the Australian Multicultural Foundation website um, and in, the, in the, um, uh, the tool that's just been released by Mira at Empatiku, and fortunately there's an English translation, so that's very helpful, is, um, as an example, um, a, a well-known case of, um, of Dania who um, uh, who went to Syria um, at the height of the caliphate and took a whole family contingent, ended up with 18 people going, um, found out that it wasn't utopia, it was miserable, tried three times to leave, finally were successful, were picked up by the Indonesians and taken back, and then the question is, where do they go? Her father ended up serving time in, in, in prison because it was judged as a civil servant who had sold his business, state the family to Syria, that he was a culpable. Fairly short sentence given the um, circumstances they recognised he was not wanting to become a terrorist, he was just wanting to join this utopian project. Um, they're out now, and I, I saw them uh, earlier this year, doing really well. One of the challenges was finding a place for them to be relocated in South Jakarta, in, um, in Depot, as it happens, and um, Empatiku had worked with the local government. And a local um, village head, um, urban village, 
who, who was female, I think was probably significant, uh, she said, we'll have them here. We can find a place for them. You know, we, we, we know that they need to be helped. And that's, that's working really well. So just to wrap up, um, this is a work in progress, uh, whether it's people coming out of prison or people coming back from Syria or elsewhere, because some Indonesians also went to, uh, to Mindanao and other locations. Uh, we lack the tools to judge risk properly, although there's some developmental work being done in this space. Um, there's uh, lots of times when things don't work, there's lots of ways it can fail. But if you ask yourself the question, what's the alternative? This is, you know, like, like every other kind of rehabilitation, much better to um, attempt and try and improve and get some success than have nothing at all. And when you meet people who have, I'm sure many of you had this experience, when if people have been given a second chance for rehabilitation, um, it's, you know, emotionally very powerful to see how they've come to realise how important it is to uh, recognise their mistakes and how, they, how much they want to try and work with others to try and make a positive contribution. That's certainly Dania's case. Um, um, there's a real desire to try and um, you know, give payback to society because of the mistakes that they've made. And I think that should remind us that this is inherently worthwhile doing. The alternative, of course, is that we, we don't try and then we have people who are released from prison and have no control, there's no uh, legal obligations, or eventually find their way back from Syria or elsewhere, we have no control, or we remain at large and we have no control, um, and we know what happens when that's the case. Thank you so much, Greg. I think I was really struck by just the practical challenges of how, how a government might deal with a large number of returnees, both in the prison environment and in the community environment, and I think your presentation really uh, illustrated that really well.